Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritis. Today is Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. Title of today's podcast is Climate Crisis. Not because we are going to discuss the actual climate, but because it is really much taking shape as we predicted months ago. That the next crisis that was going to be presented before us, either after COVID-19 should pass or in combination with it, is all about the climate. And today we happen to have Tweedledee and Dingbat give some testimony today before the House Financial Committee. And of course, that means Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, and our Treasury Secretary, Janet Dingbat Yellen. And there was no breaking news from them. It's the same old song and dance. I don't have much to add to this. And of course, I don't have much to add with respect to what our fearless and great elected officials were questioning them on. A bunch of nonsense, a bunch of gibberish. A complete waste of time. No matter if you spent 10 minutes watching it or you watched the whole thing. A complete waste of time. But, of course, what is interesting to note is how both of them were talking more in depth about climate and the climate crisis. And it's not just, of course, our central bank and our federal government that has been discussing the climate and climate crisis, but other central banks in other countries around the world have been and continue to do so. In fact, you have climate committees and climate working groups or whatever you want to call them being established within central banks. The ECB is one of them. And as we heard Today, I believe it was from Leo Brainerd, a governor of the Federal Reserve, who she might become the next Fed chair once Jerome Powell's term expires, I believe next year. She was noting how the Federal Reserve is also going to establish some type of working group or a division within the Federal Reserve to tackle climate crisis. These people can't do what they are supposed to do. Now we're going to add the weather to the mix? I mean, this is sort of laughable if you think about it. I mean, jokingly, you have these two professions, um, the economy and the weatherman. How can you be so wrong and yet still have a job? So now we're going to combine these things under one roof at the Federal Reserve. At least the difference between these types of economists and the weather guy is if you stick your head out the window and you see what's going on, the weatherman's going to say, yeah, that's, that's what's going on. But if you stick your head out the window to see what's going on in the economy, these jokers at the Federal Reserve will tell you, no, no, that's not true. You're witnessing higher prices. You're experiencing inflation. That's not true. You just don't understand what you're looking at. So at least you have to give the weather guy a pat on the back for being a little bit more honest than these central bankers, because that's all they do is lie, lie, lie and continue on with these various narratives. So as I stated a few months ago, when the New Zealand Prime Minister came out and announced that New Zealand has eradicated COVID-19, blah, 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 now the next thing she moved on to immediately was announcing and declaring a climate emergency. And I said, look out, this is what they're going to start pushing. Now, this should be no surprise to anybody. They've been talking about this stuff forever. But nonetheless, you have to have the right environment to start pushing these things forward. And you have COVID-19 with these restrictions and these lockdowns, and you have people becoming conditioned to simply listening to what the media says, to what a mayor says, a governor, whatever it might be, wherever you are. Oh, we got to shut down, got to lock down, you got to do this, got to put the mask on, blah, 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 blah. So I imagine that there will be studies out, and some of them are already starting to come out, with respect to all of these lockdowns. And of course, that's less economic activity. That's less pollution in the streets, in the air, in the water. And they'll say how much cleaner the air became, how much cleaner the water became, how wildlife came back to various areas where they're typically not, or they haven't been seen in years because of the noise pollution or whatever quality of the water, air, etc. Now they're coming back. Isn't that a good thing? So that'll be part of the excuse to say, don't we want nature to come back? Of course we do. I don't think that's an argument. 
The question is, what are they going to tell us to do in order for that to happen? Are they going to continue with these lockdowns, which are still going on, by the way? Italy, France, and now Germany is putting on further restrictions and lockdowns because of Easter. Okay, I have mentioned this several times before that this is a Milgram experiment. Now, I know I haven't gone into great detail as to what that is. I said, look it up if you're familiar with it. Start thinking about it and sort of comparing that experiment to what we're going through today. I am going to have to do a discussion on this maybe this week, but definitely next. So within next 10 days or so, call it, I will have a discussion on the Milgram experiment so that everybody understand what's going on. Because that's exactly what I think this is at this juncture. Because this is not... January, February, March of 2020 anymore. This is March of 2021. We have information. We have the data. We have comparisons between the lockdowns and restrictions versus non-lockdowns, non-restrictions. And this is now a complete joke. It's a complete joke. The economy is being destroyed. It's all about consolidation. If you're a small business, maybe even a mid-sized business, you are non-essential. But if you're in the Dow 30 or the S&P 500, you are essential. You can remain open. Yes, we'll tell the small businesses to do X, Y, Z so that they can open up. And then we'll simply tell you, you have to shut down again. And then here in this country, the United States of America, we pass several trillions of dollars worth of legislation. And another $3 trillion is coming. And believe me, they will pass it. It doesn't mean that it's going to be $3 trillion in one, one big swoop. I don't expect that to happen, but little by little, they will pass it. They will pass it, and the Federal Reserve and other central banks will cheer it on because we got to save the climate, we got to do the infrastructure, we got to do the Green New Deal, have to make these green investments because it's all about the climate crisis. You got the vaccination, you got the second vaccination. Oh, they seem to be working, but we got to get to a certain number, maybe 50%, 70% for herd immunity, but that won't be enough because it's never enough. Don't wear a mask, put one on, they're good for you. Now you should wear two masks. Now you should stand six feet away from each other. Now it's okay if children stand three feet away from each other now that they can go back to school. They're making this stuff up. That's part of the Milgram experiment. It's just about how much Will you tolerate so long as the decision or the order is coming from an authority figure, whether that's a politician, whether that's a doctor or some quote unquote health expert, somebody from a CDC or the WHO or their counterparts internationally, how much are you willing to tolerate? It's coming to a breaking point, but that's all this is. This is just seeing how far the authorities can push the masses before they break. And we're starting to see those breaks around the globe, one after the next. Sometimes it's just, you know, some weekend warriors, but they remain consistent to go out and protest on the weekends. Some of them, of course, picking up steam and are becoming a little bit more prevalent. But it's always that intersection of what's taking place economically, which is a disaster and remains a disaster, what's happening politically, which is a disaster, and what's happening socially. This is just getting started. All Everybody who was happy that 2020 is in the rearview mirror, I said, ah, I don't think so. I don't think so because they didn't solve a damn thing in 2020. They just threw trillions of dollars into the system. And later in the podcast, I'm going to talk about some of this wealth inequality, if you will, that has been occurring. And as we stated yesterday, other news agencies were talking about this too, but I was citing Bloomberg, how they noted that the top 1% saw a nice chunk of change come their way last year. Their net worth increased by $4 trillion. $4 trillion a top 1%. One year. During a pandemic. During one of the worst economic situations we have ever witnessed. You see where the money's going? Follow the money. It's not that difficult. But as long as you got your $1,400 stimulus check or $2,000 or whatever they were throughout the past year, 
your sit down and shut up money. That's exactly what people did. They took it, they sat down, and they shut their mouths. I'm not going to be surprised if they come up with another one. Whether it's in part of this $3 trillion monstrosity or something supplementary to it. Because nothing is going to be solved just because they passed the $1.9 trillion piece of crap. That's only going to get us through September. Isn't that amazing? A spending bill that would be one of the largest economies on the planet, on its own, the $1.9 trillion would be, but the size of Brazil. That's only going to get us through September at least with respect to a lot of these unemployment programs. Now, some of these other things, of course, might take time, might spread out a little bit. But nonetheless, you get my point. And now they want to add another $3 trillion on top of it. And again, nobody asked these people these questions. Nobody asked Tweedledee or Dingbat, why do we have to pay taxes anymore? If you don't care about the size of the deficit, well, then what good are the tax dollars? They clearly don't matter. It's clearly not some type of economic or financial constraint. It should be. But it's not. When we bring in three and a half trillion in tax revenue, roughly, and we're going to spend eight trillion. I mean, that's ridiculous. That was last year. We're going to do the same thing this year. Nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it. We still have at least 18 million Americans collecting some form of unemployment insurance, according to last week's Department of Labor report for initial jobless claims. We still have millions in food bank lines. We still have a countless number of people waiting in the wings for evictions. None of this stuff is talked about. None of this is discussed. Yet somehow, somehow, Tweedledee and Dingbat want to say, well, the economic recovery is underway. And of course, they'll cherry pick their data and they'll continue with the narrative. But how are we supposed to combat this climate crisis? I mean, that truly is the perpetual crisis, isn't it? I mean, the climate is always changing. I've been to many museums. I've seen the dinosaurs. They always appear to be standing up or walking or however they have them posing. I've never seen any of them in an SUV or a truck, or wearing a hard hat, pulling the levers of a coal plant. I've, I've never seen them do that. But we have gone through periods of extreme weather. Heat and ice. Without the SUVs, without the plants, without blah, 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 blah. Now, are we contributing factors? I'm sure we are. It's an environment. We are part of the environment. We have an impact. Everybody wants cleaner water, cleaner air. I don't think anybody wants the oceans polluted. And a lot of these things are criminal. And yes, it has an impact. But we are obviously going to be blamed for the vast majority of it by our authority figures. And if they say we have to shut down for a couple months every year to allow the air to clean up, and that's what we're going to do, because that's what we have to do. Well, where's the money going to come from to sustain all this stuff? Well, we'll just print it. It doesn't matter. Can we at least have an open conversation with our political leaders and with our central bankers about this? If, this, if we're going to redo the system, shouldn't we have a say in it? Shouldn't there be an open discussion about it as opposed to just saying, well, this is what we're going to do because we know what's best for you, and you're just going to tolerate it. You're just going to sit there and take it. And if you give us some lip, well, if you're in a country the size of the United States, well, we can at least write you some checks. And at least you will sit down and shut up. I don't know if the rest of the world's population is going to go for that for much longer. It's going to buy us some time. That's all it has done. And of course, I admit it has bought us more time than what I had thought. And of course, I'm hope I was hopeful. I was hopeful that market forces would have overwhelmed the central bank's in federal governments by now, because that's what needs to happen. Because the further this nonsense and insanity goes, the worse the snapback is going to be, because it's basically going to be a, a, a no mercy event. Liquidations, 
23% of U.S. corporations are classified as zombies. That number continues to rise. They're going to get wiped out. They're gone. How many jobs is that? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? How many jobs is that? Gone. Once the market says, okay, we got to liquidate, you know, debt holders are going to have to take a haircut. Equity holders are going to get wiped out. Boom, 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 boom. Not good. But... Unfortunately, that is what's needed because all of these zombie corporations and everything else is just stunting future growth and prosperity. It is basically handicapping it. It is preventing it from taking place. Also, we can make things look good today. And I have to stress the word look because they are not good, fundamentally speaking. Nobody wants to have these conversations. I would at least respect having these conversations. Well, this is just going to be the new system, folks. At least say why. At least say that that's what we're doing as opposed to saying, well, we just got to do this temporarily. And of course, temporarily turns into 12, 13 years with respect to quantitative easing. Well, we're just going to do this because it's in the depths of the GFC. One of the worst environments we've been in since the Great Depression. So we're going to try this. We're going to get creative, but we only want it to be temporary. Well, the thing is almost a teenager now. That's not temporary. So forgive me for not believing these people when they come on and say, well, we're only going to keep interest rates low this time for a little bit longer. Or we're going to reduce our respective uh, central bank balance sheets. It's going to be on autopilot. We're going to taper because the economy was so great a few years ago. Couldn't handle it. What makes anybody think that the economy and the markets can handle higher yields in rates now. They can't. You can't do it. We're pricing people out of various markets. Younger people are buying into a stock market at all-time highs, prices and valuations. We have people buying homes, prices, all-time highs. People can't afford them, being priced out of them. And once that market corrects, and it will, it will in time, so many people are going to be wiped out. They're going to have negative equity. And they're not going to be able to renegotiate anything. They're not going to be able to refinance because they're locking in some of the best rates they'll ever see in their lifetime. So they're not going to refinance at a higher rate. This is not going to happen. Especially if you have the other liquidation taking place in other parts of the economy. Their jobs could be on the chopping block. So how are they going to afford it? They're not. This is why all of these actions are classified as malinvestment and distortions. Because that's what they are doing. They are distorting our reality. They are distorting our vision of what's really taking place. They make things look good, but it's at the expense of something. There is no free lunch. Some people are starting to wake up. I, I see this a little bit more on some social media. I see this a little bit more in some of the comment sections I watch on some videos on YouTube, some articles I'll read here and there. People are starting to wake up a little bit, but is it too little too late? Because at this juncture, what can really be done? Not much. Except having an open and honest conversation with each other, as a country, as a people, that what we have been doing and allowing to be done was nonsense and that people are going to have to roll up their sleeves and sacrifice. And a lot of people already sacrifice as it is, working two, three jobs and still living paycheck to paycheck. So it's not going to be an easy sell. And of course, no politician wants to bite the bullet. No central banker wants to bite the bullet. Nobody wants to take responsibility or accountability for any of this. The music cannot stop while they're on guard. can't just can't happen. So they'll continue to do this until the system reaches exhaustion. It's like the human body. We can only run so far. We can only eat so much. We can only drink so much until, you know, you reach a point of exhaustion. And that's it. System shuts down. Pass out. Game over for a little bit. Doesn't have to be a major shock to the system. It's just reaching a point of exhaustion. 
And that is probably just as likely as anything else that we are going to witness that starts the trigger to this downfall, to this correction, which again is needed. It will be excruciatingly painful. There is no easy way out of this. But what will central bankers and federal governments attempt to do? They will attempt to take the easiest way out. And the easiest way out of a lot of these problems is inflation. Just print the money. Just print the money. Now, of course, that is very destructive, obviously. But it may be the more politically expedient, quote-unquote, solution. And, of course, we all know about political expediency. And that usually being the best choice or the one that politicians and central bankers think is the best choice. Because there's obviously a, a big argument out there between people who are in the deflationary camp and the inflationary camp. And of course, as I've stated many times before, you can have both. It's a question of what goods or services you're talking about. But what I am most concerned about are people. And when it comes to that, it's those inflationary pressures which I think are more destructive at the end of the day. Because that's, these are the things, these are the goods and services that are, people are going to need to live to survive. And as far as I'm concerned, those prices are going to continue to go up. Will you have downward price pressure somewhere? Oh, of course you will. Of course. But I am concerned about the people. Because that's really what matters at the end of the day. So, climate crisis... It's already here, it's been here, but that is the next narrative because that will allow central banks to, to just always continue to prime the printing press, to keep it going. Because, well, we got to build technologies, we got to build infrastructure. Well, where's the money going to come from? We'll print it. Don't worry about it, we'll print it. And it's always going to be something else because it's never enough. So just be on the lookout for that every time you hear it. You're going to hear it a lot more, I do believe. So market performance, we have the dollar index at 92 spot 37. 92 spot 37, a strong rally here in the dollar, hitting levels where we were a few weeks ago. Bitcoin is at $54,100 a coin. And of course, with this dollar strength, it is broad based, so some general weakness across the major currency pairs. Overnight futures trading, we have the Dow Jones flat. The S&P 500 is also trading flat. And the NASDAQ 100 is in the green, up about four-tenths of 1%. It was a down day across the board on Wall Street today, especially in the small caps with the Russell 2000. Cash trade in Japan is down 1.6% at the time of the podcast, giving back 477 points. Pretty much a sea of red across the pond in Europe. However, the Spanish markets put on the biggest gain at about six-tenths of one percent. Cash trade in Australia putting on a gain of six-tenths as well. And the cash trade in China is down 1.2 percent. On the commodity front with the strengthening dollar today, some broad-based weakness on commodities and precious metals. WTI is at $57.81. Brent is at $60.85. And natural gas is at $2.51. And of course, the narrative that is out there now is the yes, the strengthening dollar, but also looking at things a little bit more heavily on the demand side, because you have further restrictions, further lockdowns, and you have rising cases of COVID-19. And as we have stated many times before, from the demand side of things, yes, prices would be and most likely should be lower. So if, that wants to, if that's going to be the narrative that's driving things, yeah, I, I can see that happening. But if you look at what's going on with the inflationary pressures and supply chain disruptions, that's a counterbalancing uh, force in who is going to win out at the end of the day. And I think prices are likely going to end up higher at the end of the day when the dust settles. But this is a process. That's markets. Gold and silver did not have a good day either. Gold is at $1,731 an ounce, and silver is at $25.21 an ounce, so flirting very closely with a 24 handle, which we haven't seen in a while. And on the bond front, we have Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note yielding 1.6%, so continuing with that reversal, 
which again is no surprise. Nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. But of course, the narrative has been with the 10-year yield increasing, that was putting downward pressure on the stock market, especially the tech-heavy sector, and in specific, or in word, more so with uh, respect to uh, the NASDAQ. Well, we have the 10-year yield going down, yet we had stocks go down as well. Now, could that be because of the demand story with further lockdowns and restrictions, with a increasing rate of, uh, or an increase in the cases of COVID-19? Or is it on the back of a strengthening dollar? I mean, whatever they want to pick, they will pick. Whatever they want to pick, they will pick. Whatever suits the story of the day is what they're going to run with. I just want you to understand at a deeper level what's going on, how to connect the dots. So some of this wealth inequality here, all right? So what I'm looking at is the total net worth, okay, by various wealth percentiles. So the total net worth held by the top 1%, the 99th to the 100th wealth percentiles, is currently at $38.6 trillion. And yes, as you guessed it, this is an all-time high, and this graph is quite vertical too. Total net worth held by the 90th to 99th wealth percentiles comes in at 46.99 trillion. Let's just call it 47, because this is most recently updated for the fourth quarter of 2020. I am sure it is higher. Total net worth held by the bottom 50 percent, first to 50th wealth percentiles, is at 2.48 trillion, so almost two and a half trillion. Okay, so you're at 47 trillion for the 90th to 99th percentiles. You're at 38, almost 39 trillion for the top one percent, and you're at two and a half trillion dollars for the bottom 50th percent. Can you say wealth inequality? Yes, you can. Now, I guess the bright note, if you're looking at the chart, is that with respect to the bottom 50th percent, they sort of bottomed out following the great financial crisis back in 2011, 2010, and then they were not even, I mean, it, it, terrible numbers, terrible numbers but they have been steadily increasing since 2011, yet just nowhere really to what's been taking place uh, for the top 1%. Okay, that's where the money's going. We understand what quantitative easing is. It's the greatest wealth transfer ever in the history of mankind. We know that that was part of the process because they told us that was part of the process. That was going to be the experiment, that they wanted financial prices financial asset prices to increase, and that's exactly what took place, okay? So those are the numbers. Those are the absolute numbers there, okay? Dollars, I should say. Here's a percentage. So if we're looking at the share of total net worth held by the top 1%, it's at 31.4%. This is an all-time high. If we're looking at the share of the total net worth held by the 90th to 99th wealth percentiles, we're at 38.2%. This number peaked during the great financial crisis and has been slightly lower, but is somewhat plateauing for the 90th to 99th percentile, again at 38.2%. For the share of total net worth held by the 50th to the 90th wealth percentiles, we're at 28.3%. This number peaked back uh, shortly after the dot-com bust, so call it 2003, and has been steadily declining since then, so that is not good. Basically, that would be the middle class, if you will, the 50th to the 90th percentile. Their share of overall wealth has been decreasing since the early 2000s. And then the share of total net worth held by the bottom 50th percent is at 2%. Yes, you heard me correctly, 2%. And the same story holds. This number has been steadily increasing since that 2011 bottom, but nonetheless, 2%. This number peaked back in the early 90s at about four and some odd percent. Okay, so 
This is what's going on. This is the economy. Uh, this type of breakdown would not occur, I don't believe, in a free market capitalistic system. I just don't think it could happen. But when you have a centrally planned system, when you have a highly corrupt political system where our politicians are allowed to pick winners and losers, where they have access to trillions and trillions of dollars every single year, what do you think is going to happen? This is what happens. If this money was allowed rather to circulate throughout the economy in private hands, making free and private and individual transactions, I don't think we would see this type of wealth inequality, but we do because we don't have a free market capitalistic system. Oh no, it has to be centrally planned and organized. And now it's going to be the drumbeat, the steady drumbeat of one crisis after the next. And we still don't know the long-term effects of COVID-19 itself. And we still don't know the long-term effects of these various vaccines. Maybe they're great. Maybe two of them are great and the rest of them are garbage and it proves that way. We, we just don't know. We are human guinea pigs walking around if you have decided to take these vaccines. I understand why you've made the decision to take it. Would not have been my decision, but your body, your choice, right? That's what we're told. Absolutely right. Your body, your choice. Do what you want. You want to be a walking human guinea pig? Knock yourself out. There's just not enough data on these vaccines where I would feel comfortable taking it in my position. Now, of course, everybody has their own position. That's why you may have decided to take it. I understand it. But we don't even know the long-term effects of COVID-19 itself. <sighs> but it's a crisis. Everything is a crisis. And then obviously the other sad news is we have some mass shootings uh, that have been taking place in the country. But the, the mainstream media doesn't want to focus on, uh, you know, the stuff that takes place uh, in Chicago which is equally as bad. They don't want to talk about that stuff. And you basically have the left wing and the liberal racism, right, against white people. And you had a lot of people take to Twitter immediately on word of the shooting that took place out in Colorado. Well, this has to be a white guy. And it has to be a conservative. And it has to be a Trump supporter. He, I mean, everything. Draped in the American flag or a Nazi flag or a Trump flag with the MAGA hat. And of course, that wasn't the case. Not the case at all. Completely different story, completely different narrative. But you just see how eager they are to prove themselves correct. Because the left thinks that they are intellectually superior. They think that they are the righteous ones. The ones with the moral code. This is ridiculous. They have no tolerance. They don't like racism, but yet they're the only ones that bring it up. They bring it up all the time. Everything is about racism. And it's always old white guys. What's Joe Biden? Isn't he an old white guy? How did he end up there? How about Chuck Schumer? He's the leader of the Senate. Isn't he an old white guy or Dick Durbin, another leader within the Senate? Or Patrick Leahy, Senator Leahy. Isn't he an old white guy? How can they tolerate this in the Democratic Party? That's the devil. That's the evil. Yet that's who's representing them. Is that okay? I, I just don't get it. And then they never stop. They never give up on this. Every single day. Race, 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 race. Old white people, white people, white men, white men, young white men, radicals, bop, 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 terrorists, bop, bop, bop. They just, it's brainwashing. What don't you understand? How can you not pick up on this? All about race even though one of the leaders of the, the, the civil rights movement with Dr. King, who has a beautiful monument and memorial in Washington, D.C., by the way, you know, what's he known for? What's he known for? Oh, please do not judge my children based on the color of their skin, but rather on the content of their character. Oh, no, not now, not today, not today. Don't even have the facts. Oh, something happened? Oh, Got to be a Nazi. Got to be a Trump supporter. Got to be a white guy. This is ridiculous. I don't know how people can listen to these people. I really don't. They're sick. They're sick in the head. And all it does is serves to further divide the country, which is what we most definitely do not need. And then another thing to keep on your radar 
is we have the George Floyd trial starting. And let me tell you something. I will not be surprised if the officer who was on trial gets off. Or if the jury does convict, they're going to convict him on some of the lower charges against him. That's just somewhat of a prediction, something to keep in the back of your mind. Because, look, we know what took place last year with respect to George Floyd and his tragic death, which it was. But nonetheless, when the facts come out, and it's not just the media, and it's not just, you know, people who have issues with the justice system which is right. There are many, many problems with our justice system. We talk about them here all the time. It's most definitely a two-tier justice system. But do not be surprised if that police officer is not convicted, if he is found to be not guilty. Don't be surprised. Or if he is found guilty, it's going to be on some of the lesser charges. Because some of the information that's starting to come out a little bit more on this trial, eh, just does not look as compelling as the media had it look last year. So if that should happen, this officer gets off, you can guess what will happen in the streets. But it's a climate crisis. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.